Hey everybody, uh, this little lesson here is going to be about warm fronts and we're going to help you understand what they are, how they work, and what you can expect when you have them. On this opening slide you see the red symbol with uh, the semicircle and the semicircles are all on the same side and that is the symbol that we use for a warm front. Now keep in mind when you are reading a map on a test in class I don't have a photocopier that's going to color copy. So therefore, you need to get to recognize the shape of the symbol, not the color, because it won't be in color. So starting at the beginning, what, what's a front? Well, it, it turns out that's the name that meteorologists use for describing the boundary between two opposing air masses. Remember when we talked about air masses, we said air masses are of different densities. So when they hit into each other, they don't mix easily. They stay separate. And when we look at the interaction of air masses, it, it seems like there's a boundary between them, that they don't easily mix. So we call that boundary a front. And uh, basically, if we say, well, where did they come up with the name front? It, it stems back to uh, the discovery taking place somewhere around the time of World War I. Um, and when you look at uh, World War I and how battles were fought, they, they would dig a trench and you'd have two sides fighting each other at, at the, what was called the front line. And, and so the meteorologist said, well, it, it really resembles that kind of battling forces, one side versus the other. And this is the front line that divides where one forces versus the other. And, and so they thought of air masses as being in a battle and, and they're a meeting and clashing at the front. And that's where that comes from. So we're going to look specifically at warm fronts and what happens with warm fronts. Oh, my computer just went a little bit crazy right there. All right, so um, what is a warm front? Um, when we look at how it's happening, it's going to be the name that we give the boundary when the warmer air mass is advancing into a colder air mass. So you name an air mass or a front by the type of air that is doing the pushing, the one that is advancing into the other one. So that's why we would call this one a warm front. If those warmer temperatures that you're seeing down in this region here are advancing into the colder temperatures, we would call this a warm front. One more thing on this um, picture right here is take note of the fact of, okay, so when you see the semicircles on the uh, side right here, it's, it's my sign that the colder air is over here. This is the direction of mo motion of the warm front and the warmer air is behind it. All right, so when we think about, well, what do you associate with a warm front? Uh, things that we would tend to see in a warm front would be clouds and steady precipitation for an extended time period. So we want to think about, well, why is it that we're going to get these conditions from a warm front? And the answer is, look at the way the boundary takes place. And so when we draw a boundary in a profile view, so we're looking at an air mass that's back here advancing into a colder air mass that's over here. And as that warmer air mass is pushing against the colder air mass, it's riding over the top. And so it is it's kind of going on this gradual slope where the warm air is gradually rising over the top. And as we learned in our last unit, rising air is going to lead to adiabatic cooling. Adiabatic cooling to the dew point gets us condensation. We get clouds. We're going to get precipitation. And so this is a common pattern that's associated with warm fronts. So if we look at are there ways that a person could recognize an approaching warm front if you didn't have a weather map and you, you weren't looking at something like that? Well, two signs. One, look at the sky and what kind of clouds are you seeing? The first sign of an approaching warm front would be clouds that look like what you see here. These are known as cirrus clouds. They are very high, 
thin ice crystal clouds. And they're often at that leading edge of the warm front. And you'll see when we pull up a, a picture that shows that connection. Another thing is going to be the uh, barometer. And what is the barometer doing? A falling barometer, a steadily falling barometer, not one that goes through a rapid drop, but a, a slow and steady drop in the barometer. That's in a, another way that you can see a warm front is actually approaching you. So if we try to break down those two things that we just said. So first of all, we said cirrus clouds are a, a leading indicator. So look at this um, layout and we see, okay, what if we had a warm front that was the, the boundary at the surface is somewhere behind or west of St. Louis. And that warm air mass is pushing over the top of the cold air and pushing the whole system to the east. So we see that we've got high thin clouds way out here by Pittsburgh. And so those high thin clouds, you're looking up at the sky in Pittsburgh, you see those um, cirrus clouds, you're saying, this is a sign that my weather is going to turn bad in the next 12 hours or so. It, because this warm front is going to be slowly moving across. And, and so the, the progression of clouds would get lower and thicker as the warm front approaches. And so that's something that you can look at the sky and try to see, okay, there's a sign that I've got an approaching warm front. The, the other thing I had mentioned was a falling barometer. And if you consider what's happening in this picture, you can see why a falling barometer would happen. Remember, barometers measure pressure, and atmospheric pressure is the weight of the air. If you consider a big column of cold air that's sitting on top of Pittsburgh with a little bit of warm air riding over the top, this is going to weigh a lot. And, and so you're going to get higher pressure in Pittsburgh than you will find in Columbus, Ohio. So when you get to Columbus, they've got a little bit smaller patch of cold air over the top of them and a little bit more of the warmer air that's going to be less dense and lighter. So as a result, a little bit less weight of the air column at Columbus. And when you get to Indianapolis, it's going to be even less because there's more warm air, less cold air. So we'll see that steady drop in the barometer um, indicating a falling uh, pressure level as the warm front is approaching. So you notice we get into the lower clouds and that's where we're going to find the precipitation taking place. And you can expect steady precipitation for a good amount of time. As far as why is it lasting for a good amount of time, one of the things to consider is what's the speed that the front is going to be moving at. And when we think about a warm front, the less dense air mass is the one that's doing the pushing. So it's not going to be able to push very effectively through the cold, dense air mass that's out in front of it. It's going to be doing a lot of riding over the top of it. It does push it a little bit along the way, but the advance is not that quick. And so as a result, uh, you end up with longer periods of rain because you're under those um, stratus and nimbo stratus clouds for a longer time period. And those are going to be the ones that are going to get you the, the precipitation.